Wow. Okay, so I think I think we're recording now. Um, all right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nate Polash. I'm uh, one of the organizers for Cafe Scientifique Twin Ports, and uh, today uh, we wanted to do a short video with Emily Stone um, to talk about a really neat. Uh, photography technique that Emily has been utilizing recently. Um, anyway, uh, so a, a little bit about Emily. Uh, Emily is a naturalist and an education uh, director for the Cable Natural History Museum in Cable, Wisconsin. Um, if you are one of the Cafe Scientifique Twin Ports uh, diehards, you will recognize Emily from uh, her presentation um, a couple years back, which was telling us all about uh, interpretation and and some of the amazing stories that exist out in, out in the wild. Um, I remember uh, an awesome retelling of pitcher plant ecology, which I really appreciated. Um, but yeah, and so um, yeah, again, uh, I asked Emily to come on uh, tonight to tell us a little bit about uh, a new um, I don't know if hobby is the right word, but a new technique that she's been using to to look at the natural world. So. Um, Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on. Um, so first of all, I just wanna give a shout out to the Cable Natural History Museum where I work in Cable, Wisconsin. It's about an hour and a half from Duluth. And our new exhibit is called Mysteries of the Night. And so this ties in well with that. And we are open right now with some you know, numbers, restrictions and masks and that kind of stuff. So feel free to come on down. And so the technique I've been using is uh, photography with a UV flashlight. And I have to also mention the reason that I got excited about UV fluorescence in the first place. And that was this paper written by um, professors and an awesome student at Northland College where they discovered that flying squirrels fluoresce hot pink if you shine a black light flashlight at them which just blew my mind. It actually kind of went viral in the science world and pop culture and everything. So that got me thinking about fluorescence a little bit more. And as we started building our Mysteries of the Night exhibit, I ordered a black light flashlight so that I could play around with this a little bit more. So this is um, a photo from one of the researchers, Jonathan Martin. And then this is my photo of a flying squirrel at my neighbor's house. Um, so adorable <laughs> and hot pink. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> fast though. So um, this is the, the best photo I was able to get of them because of a combination of needing a better camera and a better tripod. Um, so I have improved some a little bit since then. Um, and I wanted to share with you the equipment that I'm using. So. The first flashlight I bought is this UV Beast flashlight off Amazon. Um, and I want you to note uh, the nanometers, the wavelength that it uses. So it's kind of higher wavelength and it's much pinker, but it's also a super strong flashlight. So it works great for flying squirrels high in the trees. I also have had good luck with this little tiny um, flashlight that is um, a lower wavelength, smaller wavelength, um, 365 nanometers. And it's not quite so pink, which is actually really helpful because then the fluorescence shows through. So that's much cheaper on Amazon. You know, they sell it for checking your hotel room or whatever for gross stuff. <laughs> but whatever, it works outside um, pretty well too. Yeah. Um, so that's my equipment. And then just a variety of cameras, actually my cell phone and a couple of different other cameras. I take them outside and kind of the key is to get the lighting right and to have a steady hand. So this is a raspberry leaf in my yard. You know, I first just, well, after the mosquitoes died, I had to wait for that. Then I took the flashlight outside at night and just shined it around. And what did I find? A bunch of plants fluoresce red in UV light. And this doesn't even really do it justice. Um, you know, a bright green raspberry leaf turns red. And it's actually the chlorophyll that's fluorescing. There are some more spectacular ones um, out there. So this is a lichen I just found on my campsite in the Boundary Waters last week. So it fluoresces this brilliant yellow. And I also took a picture of it um, in regular light. So 
just this boring gray lichen on a cedar twig and in the UV light it is fantastically yellow. Um, that's always fun. So mushrooms um, are pretty fluorescent which is really fun. There was a, a foray, mushroom foray, a couple of weeks ago here and so we, I don't know, a dozen uh, mycologists and I scoured my driveway for fun stuff. So um, a white mushroom really fluoresces. Um, this is called tapioca slime mold. Hmm. I'm pretty stoked to have it on my driveway and it has this cool kind of greenish white fluorescence. Um, this is a carrion beetle eating a mushroom and its um, little mantle is usually kind of yellow. Um, but here it's that weird, like greenish white. Um, and this, this is moss, which is fluorescing red, but you can see this is with the UVB splashlight. And so everything kind of looks purple. So one thing I have done, um, they sent me or they recommended yellow safety glasses to go along with the UV flashlight. And it really helps filter out some of the extra purple. Um, it also protects your eyes. So I highly recommend if you get the higher, longer wavelength flashlight, you also get the yellow safety glasses. And I've also put like taken photos through the yellow safety glasses and that helps a lot. I'm working on getting a filter. Oh, if you get cool. the other, the smaller flashlight, you don't need that though. Um, this is a tiny little grub in the moss. Um, I should also mention that I've been playing around with a super macro camera at the same time as the black light. So most of the things I take pictures of are tiny, uh, which is fun. And a cool mushroom that looks yellow in the black light. Just, you know, the world comes alive. It's really fun. A lot of stuff is pretty drab and it, you know, it doesn't really show up in the black light. And then all of a sudden something will glow. So this is a coral fungus. It's like, I was actually going to ask, like, when you're out there looking around, is it, I mean, have you started to develop sort of a, an instinct for what might fluoresce and what might not at this point? Are you looking for specific things or are you kind of just taking the flashlights out and just surprised all the time by what's glowing and what's not? Some of both. Um, there are a lot of lichens that fluoresce, so shining your light at tree trunks or at like in my campsite in the Boundary Waters, I have a picture coming up. It just, it was amazing. It just sparkled like a, a starlit sky <laughs> or something. So, you know, things with lichens and mushrooms tend to fluoresce. A lot of plants fluoresce red. It's not like super eye-catching, but it's different. And then, um, man, just when I'm out in nature, the closer I look at things, the more amazed I am, whether I have the black light flashlight or not. So I tend to go around, I have like a steep road cut along my driveway that's just covered in moss and lichens and little stuff. So mm -hmm. I just nose around in that and daylight or UV light, I find cool stuff. So that little grub and lots of lichens and, um, mosses. Some of the mosses fluoresce, some don't, which is really a mystery I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Um, you know, grasses have a protein in their cell walls that makes them kind of blue, which is strange. Hmm. Um, this is a super bland lichen that's all over the trunks of balsam fir trees, like everywhere, and then in the black light it turns bright yellow. Um, so really, anywhere you look, and this was really interesting to discover. I've never really noticed this before, but this is the twig of a balsam fir tree. And mm -hmm. in the center there where the, the little twigs join, where the side twig joins the main one, there's a tiny bit of lichen. And every single intersection on every single balsam fir tree around my campsite has that lichen at that intersection. Like I had no idea that was there until the black light made it glow. Um, yeah definitely an avenue for discovery. This is the bedrock on Vanadad Lake in the Boundary Waters. <laughs> Just like a bunch of different types of lichen. Some rocks do glow. I don't have a great picture of that. One of the other things that got me excited about this was um, euperlites. There were some news stories about euperlites, um, which is 
um, rocks on the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is why they're called Uper, mm -hmm. like that fluoresce. They have some fluorescent minerals in them, which is not super common. Interesting. Um, and the mycologist actually found a chunk of eupralite on my driveway when they were snooping around. So it came in with a glacial till. Um, so I have this tree sap kind of glowing. <laughs> Just, you know, random stuff. And this is a different, a foliose lichen. And you can see on the tips of the thalli, there's some different chemicals there that are fluorescing blue while the rest of the thallus is just kind of bland. Um, yeah. They lichens produce all sorts of weird chemicals and some of them fluoresce. So and this is one of my favorites. I love pixie cup lichens anytime, but it's just, I mean, it just glows like crazy. Um, and there's moss behind it. So this is with the small flashlight with the shorter wavelengths. And so there's not as much like purple interference and you can really see the, the fluorescent colors pop. Oh, that's exciting. So that's all the photos I had, but do you have any other questions about what I've been up to or how I've been doing it? Um, I mean, nothing comes to mind right away. Well, I have one, one particular question, which, which, you know, is sort of just getting a feel for like what objects, you know, again, sort of, sort of are fluorescing like this. So, you know, we've got the flying squirrel in the background there. Are there other like mammals that are doing this? Is that, was that like pretty, like, um, you mentioned that that paper came out from folks at Northland and I'm just hearing about this stuff right now, but um, yeah, like what was sort of the fallout from that? Are people now, you know, like, have you checked out any other animals specifically to see how, the, if they fluoresce or not? Yeah, so, well, okay. so first of all, what inspired John Martin, the guy who first splashed the flying squirrel, to discover that is that he had just read about a tropical frog that fluoresced. So he was <laughs> trying to find a gray tree frog around here to see if that fluoresced. They don't. But while he was out in his yard, a flying squirrel flew over and he um, found out that it was pink. Um, the same team at Northland um, that wrote the flying squirrel paper is doing more research, but if they <laughs> if they told me what they found they'd have to kill me basically like <laughs> it's one of those like it's secret until it's published so um yeah. i don't know what they're doing they definitely investigated a bunch more mammals um in the original flying squirrel study they discovered that tree squirrels don't fluoresce so yeah. like gray squirrels and red squirrels don't and okay. they um they mostly tested this in um museum specimens um, okay. dead stuff but um, you know, there's, who knows what else fluoresces, and actually there are a few birds that we know fluoresce, so hmm. um, one of the hypotheses about why the flying squirrel fluoresces is so that it looks more similar to one of its predators, which is um, a thawet owl. Um, yeah, I think it's the thawet, and actually um, our barred owl mounts at the museum also has hot pink armpits. So like the the under <laughs> under That's wing awesome. covers, um, and so maybe like as the owl is gliding, it looks kind of pink from the bottom. If you can see UV light, so if the flying squirrel is gliding, it kind of looks pink from the bottom and looks similar to its predator, so it doesn't get eaten by its predator. Or, you know, there's we don't really know why it does yet, um, but actually a, a lot of things can see UV and fluoresce and fluoresce. So like there's a, a moth, I didn't include that picture, but it's wing spots were fluorescing. Um, a lot of flowers fluoresce so that bees can see them and butterflies can definitely see fluoresce, UV light too. So, you know, there's a lot of things in nature that do fluoresce, even chickadees, um, you know, they're just black and white, but the contrast between the black and the white is greater when you can see in UV and it makes them look sexier. The, you know, the brighter the contrast, contrast between the black and the white. So um, it's definitely out there. Um, mammals are more rare, um, but I think this spring you'll be hearing more from that team at Northland College about what else fluoresces. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, super neat. Like, you know, I, when I think about how much we don't, you know, it's, it's just another example of how much we don't know, right? Like, 
I mean, for you, for somebody who's studied the natural world for, you know, your entire life and who does it, you know, it's like an amazing, you know, sort of surprise in our own backyard of like, oh, you know, if only we were equipped to see things in this way. And it's just, <laughs> it's an amazing thing to think about. So I think, you know, maybe, maybe following up that with one more question. So I appreciate that you took the time to show, you know, some of the equipment that you used. And so, um, you know, we'll, like when we share the video, we'll put some links to some of the equipment for people to, um, to take a look at. Um, are you using like tripods or anything at this point? Or are you kind of just holding like a light in one hand and the camera in the other hand and trying to get the right angle or what? Yeah, what's your, what's your strategy so yeah, far? I, I should be using tripods and I'm not. Um, uh, so I, um, my favorite camera for this, because I'm doing so much macro, is the Olympus Tough TG6, okay. and it has um, super duper macro settings, and so I end up with the lens like a centimeter away from the subject, and my hand is actually resting on the ground. Um, yeah. So my, the tripod is the ground in my hand and holding that really steady. Doesn't always work. Um, and then I'm like holding the flashlight in my other hand and like aiming it just so and it's <laughs> a little bit of a mess sometimes yeah. and that's one reason I didn't get a very good shot of the flying squirrel is mm -hmm. I was using I think just my cell phone and I had tried to use a tripod but its lights were falling off so now I bought a better tripod so um, you know there's always a new toy to buy um, and there are definitely people um, on the internet doing it a lot better than me. Uh, as long as I stick with macro, I feel like my hand tripod works pretty well, though. So, cool. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Is yeah. Yeah. Really exciting. So, and you said, so the exhibit that's coming up, I, um, are you going to feature some, some of the photographs in here? Is this going to be a, a big part of the exhibit? Is this going to be the topic of it? Tell us a little bit about the upcoming exhibit. No, so and, you know, the exhibit's already already built. We are um, adding in a few new um, tidbits, though. So uh, Mysteries, is, Mysteries of the Night is all about adaptations of animals to survive the night. So hearing and eyesight and smell and um, the, the day and night cycles of trees. We have a really cool diorama too, where you can shine your flashlight around and see different animals hiding in the dark. Um, and we are planning to add probably like a black light corner in the diorama where we'll put some um, fluorescent lichens and rocks and things and then and shine a little UV light on them so that visitors can can have that experience too. It's also a very auditory exhibit. We have a bunch of different mysterious sounds um, that you might hear. Um, and we're in the process of creating an entirely online version of the exhibit too, just because of the world today. So um, very soon that'll be um, posted on the museum's Facebook page. Um, and our website too, of course, it'll be announced on the Facebook page so that you can actually read all the text, you can listen to the audio and watch a couple of videos that we have in the exhibit if you can't actually make it down to cable and visit us. And one thing, one way it could work really well is if you come and you experience kind of the ambiance, it's, it's all dark in there with backlit text and some cool lighting and stuff. And then if you don't feel like wearing a mask for as long as it takes to read all the tasks, text, you can go home and read it in the comfort of your own computer with no mask. Um, so yeah, it's, that's been really fun. Um, I, I love nocturnal stuff. I've always liked uh, giving night hikes to kids. And so next year, hopefully if we can have more public programs, we'll be offering like black light night hikes to um, maybe offering like a black light uh, rental or checkout program um, so that people can take home a flashlight for a, a night or two and check out their own yard, yeah. check out their own flying squirrels, that kind of stuff. So the best way to keep posted on that is our Facebook page, or um, we also have a weekly e-newsletter you can sign up for on our website, and that'll give lots of information about all the new stuff coming out. And that weekly e-newsletter also has my Natural Connections column in it. So mm -hmm. you mentioned that I gave a talk at the Cafe Scientifique. And that was about some of the topics in my first book, Natural Connections. Um, I now have a second Natural Connections book out too. 
and I still am writing a weekly newspaper column, which um, just last week, I was about taking the UV flashlight down my driveway and all the stuff I saw and a little bit of a description of how fluorescence works. And so that should have been in the Duluth Reader last week, I think, but it's in lots of other papers and you can also find it on our website. We'll put the link um, somewhere handy. Um, so you can check out that and, you know, as you mentioned, I really get excited about discovering new things all the time. So every week it's some new cool thing in nature that I discover and want to share with you. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah. And yeah, we'll definitely, we'll post, we'll post a bunch of links along with this just to give people information on all the different stuff you've got going on and what's happening at the Cable Natural History Museum. And, and yeah, even even the stuff where if you want to find, you know, equipment to go and take a, a an image like this or see the world like this. So, um, yeah, well, uh, on behalf of Cafe Scientifique Twin Ports, uh, I just want to say thanks a lot for uh, taking some time with me to, to talk about this and share this information. Um, what a great time to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, some nice activities that we can do sort of on our own and um, a really neat way to, to sort of see our, our world here. So um, yeah, so thank you again. And um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was super fun. All right.